I think based on our experience, our experience of contact with the public, with clients, what we see uh, often in the media programs like Digging for Britain and others, we can all agree that archaeology is generally considered to be pretty cool. <laughs> but being cool is not enough. It's not enough in terms of explaining where it is that we add value for society as a whole. So communicating this value is extremely important and it is very much part of our job as archaeologists, whether it is somebody in their first year working in the field or somebody at managerial level. I think we have always to remember that we're all ambassadors of the profession. We're all ambassadors of archaeology. So let's talk about the perceptions and why we really need to make the effort in communicating archaeology, why it's important and why being cool is not enough. I think you're all familiar with headlines like this. Archaeologists unearth once in a lifetime discovered of complete Roman statues in the UK. And this was related to the HS2. But then we're also familiar with this. Is archaeology being used to make HS2 look good? And then again, another example. Folk tale becomes reality as Roman altar unearthed Le a Leicester Cathedral. Beautiful, fantastic. At the same time, Leicester Cathedral, a mount of graves found, delays restoration. Terrible. So I think what we can take away from this is that the discoveries defines the excitement of bringing the past back to light is what people find really cool. But at the same time, the profession of archaeology, the real work, getting the hands dirty and maybe um, delaying the restoration of Leicester Cathedral is a very different story. It's not very well understood, I don't think, among the public. It, archaeology is a very convenient scapegoat for failings elsewhere in the, in the planning system. And as a result, sometimes we do get bad publicity. And I'm sure that the journalist personally doesn't have anything against us as archaeologists, people trying to do our job. But this is the result. We get a very bad reputation. The truth is that most people are not really aware of the link between the really exceptional discoveries like the statues um, at, uh, uh, on the HS2 and the daily work, the, the profession, the, the being trying to be professional and acting in, uh, in a certain way, upholding certain standards. And people are not aware of where it is that we fit in in the planning process and also where we fit in in building the future world by digging up the past. So the focus is communicating archaeology to non-archaeologists because it's easy to talk amongst ourselves. We all think we're really cool. We all think that what we, what we do every day is the best job in the world. But what happens when we have to talk to other people? I stepped on something. So first of all, we have to understand what makes good communication. And there are three elements to it. Uh, that are very important to consider whenever we engage with any stakeholders, be uh, the public, being a client, uh, another organization, some of the organizations that we've heard from today. Um, and the three key parts are the message, the audience, and trust. Trust is very, very important. They're all three interconnected. They all feed into each other and they all shape each other as well. So let's look at the message first. As Stephen mentioned earlier, the message needs to be clear, concise, active, specific, positive, and I've added accessible. And I mean accessible both in terms of how it is understood by uh, the 
the external people, the people who are outside our sector, but also very important uh, nowadays, accessibility in terms of how it can be accessed by people that have different levels of ability. So, for example, I'm thinking, you know, adding um, alternative text for pictures and similar things. Um, however, um, archaeology, we must remember that archaeology sometimes comes across as very highbrow and inaccessible. And, you know, it's, it's understandable. We have to communicate so many details, many dates. We have a lot of jargon, mm -hmm. a lot of it. We have what, what we dig up are very complex stories that, of course, we want to share. But we need to do it in a way that is accessible to everyone, not just to people who have our level of understanding and experience. So first of all, let's avoid jargon. Let's not do archaeologist speak. Stephen earlier <laughs> mentioned archaeological unit, which I think everyone in this room knows what we mean by. But if you, if you go on the street now, if you walk outside this hotel and ask somebody, do you know what an archaeological unit is? They're going to be confused. They're, they are going to have no idea what, what you mean. And then, of course, we're, we're also thinking about other terms that for us are absolutely normal. Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic. Well, outside of here is Stone Age. And it's, it's, it seems very reductive and sometimes it might seem that is making our profession very, very simple, too simple. But the reality is that you have to meet people where they are and you have to speak in a language that they can understand. So let's, let's try to make sure that the words that we use, whether we are talking to the dog walker that happens by our site or whether we're talking to a client. We use words that do not cause any confusion, are clear, very clear words that have the same meaning for us that they do for uh, the recipient of our communication. <clears throat> and also, let's remember that a message that can be understood by non-professionals leaves less room for um, weird and dubious, dodgy sometimes interpretations, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and also makes information transparent, open, and accessible. And this, in turn, helps to build trust. Let's move to trust. So we're looking at pretty striking figures here. Um, courtesy of the Professional Association Research Network. As you see, I think these figures speak for themselves how important it is and the real value of um, a chartered organization and also to be a member of that organization. So when we talk about trust, CIFA gives us a great advantage. Ensuring our message is consistent with CFS key messages demonstrates that, uh, to quote Peter this morning, <laughs> we are all accountable members of a credible organization that is ethical, upholds the highest standards of practice, and is committed to delivering real benefit for the whole of society. So when we think about the messages that we put out there, um, as professional archaeologists, let's think also about consistency because consistency of messaging is a little bit like wearing a uniform or wearing the jersey of your favorite sports team. Everyone sees it and they understand immediately that you stand for certain things. You're a supporter of that team, which means that maybe you're from a, a, a certain city or town and that you espouse certain values. So putting out there a message that is consistent with the key messages that we discussed today 
is a little bit like that, is showing which team we support and also what values we think we subscribe to and we think are important in everything that we do. And then the last uh, component of good communication is the audience. So, as I said, thinking about who we are trying to communicate with is extremely important. Several factors, I think somebody, uh, oh no, he's not here anymore, shame. Uh, several factors will determine the level of complexity and detail in our message, depending on who we are targeting, but also, of course, we, we think about age, you know, are we talking to adults or are we talking to children? The context, is it just a general discussion? Is it a publication or is it um, a talk to a local society of people that have a bit of an understanding about archeology? span And as mentioned earlier in one of the questions, the medium is also very, very important. So of course, today social media is king, as we all know, but we have also we have to think that we don't only do social media. So we always have to adapt to all of this to all these different factors whenever we consider our audiences and our messaging. But importantly, we also need to think about the likely level of interest of the audiences that we are targeting or trying to target. What makes these audiences tick? What do they care about? We have to make archaeology relevant to them. We have to explain to them why they should care about what we do, why they should care about professional archaeology having um, a, a chartered organization, having standards. Why do we need archaeology as a society? What benefit does it deliver? But we have to make it relevant to them. So for a client, it will be um, about the, the good PR that it delivers. For the local archaeological society, of course, easy sell, it will be about we're doing something that they're already interested in. For school children, we're doing something really cool that has to do with mud. Let's get them. <laughs> <laughs> so with all of this, let's look back at this headline. Of course, the intent of this headline is quite negative and that's undeniable, but let's really think what does it say? Reading between the lines and reading be behind the, the story, what does it say? It recognizes that archaeology is important. Archaeology is liked. It recognizes that archaeology and creating the link with the past which is what, as archaeologists, we're all supposed to do. We're supposed to share the knowledge that, that we dig up. Otherwise, what's the point of it? That, that sharing, that connection with the past has power, has, has the power of a good reputation, has the power of good publicity. But also, what else does this headline say? It says that HS2, probably the most controversial infrastructure project in the last 20 years, maybe 30 in this country, it needs good PR. So what, where do they go when it needs good PR? They go to archaeology. This headline tells me not only that archaeology is important and is liked, and that is also powerful, but that clients, the people that commission the work from us, they value it, they understand that power, they understand that, 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 that value, that interest, public interest that we deliver. So when we see headlines like this, of course, they hurt and it's not very nice, but let's read between the lines and take the positives where we can. <laughs> 
So now, unless there are any questions, I would like you <laughs> to take over <laughs> with a little exercise. So what's the time? Okay. Um, we're gonna split you into groups. I think it would probably be a good, a good idea to go, um, yeah, stay local. <laughs> so maybe we can have the, the first line, first row here, um, three, four, five over there. Um, mm -hmm. Would you like five, the two ladies here? And I'll say yes. And then we can do six here. <laughs> um, I don't know, rest of the line there, <laughs> or shall we split you? <laughs> yeah. So what what we're asking you to do? So what, what we're asking you to do is, based on your experiences, as a group, pick uh, one situation that maybe was challenging, or why not, even a situation that maybe still hasn't happened, that you know, is a, conver a conversation or a situation that is about to happen that you want to really give it um, a good, positive spin. <laughs> This is what we're talking about at the end of the day. Um, and think a little bit about how good communication could have helped or could help still. And please come up with a couple of ideas. I said three or four, but it's been a long day. So let's do even two, that's fine. A couple of ideas, it can be a headline, uh, just a bullet point. Um, if you have the energy, an elevator pitch <laughs> um, of how, what, how you would handle what you would say in that situation, what your message would be that could change that situation and you know, give, it, give it a positive outcome. <laughs> 